There is a statement of Jesus found in the 16th chapter of John's Gospel. At verse 33. With which none of us should disagree. I try not to disagree with the Son of God. Amen. Jesus said, In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. No truer words were ever spoken. But let's think about that for a moment. Jesus said, in the world, in this present world order, fallen, sinful, totally opposed to God, in the world, you, plural, the followers of Jesus, Christian people, you will have tribulation. Not might have, not may have, you will have tribulation. And what is tribulation? Distress, affliction, trouble, hardship, suffering. Literally to experience great pressure. To go through hard times. It is a statement of fact. You will have tribulation. And that certainly is our experience, isn't it? Yes. All of us, in varying degrees at different times from one source or another, all of us endure trouble. We suffer affliction. We experience pressure. We go through hard times. That's part of life. Jesus didn't explain it. He offered no reason for it. He didn't tell us how to escape it. He simply said what we all know to be true, we are going to have to go through it. And it has been well pointed out that we are involved in two different kinds of suffering. There is a suffering that is ours because of our humanity. Suffering is the common experience of all people on this earth. There is the physical suffering due to accident, injury, illness, and disease. There are the aches and pains of aging, living in a body that eventually gives out on us. There is the suffering of natural calamity, earthquake, tornado, hurricane, fire, flood, and famine. There is the suffering due to pressure, hard work, economic uh, distress, sinful habits, wrong choices, crime, and the unkindness of others. And there is the suffering of loss. The grief and sorrow caused by the death of others. Every person, sooner or later, meets many of these forms of suffering as part of the human experience. For no other reason than because these experiences are part of life in this world and we live in this world. Many times people experience the common suffering that is part of life, illness, accidents, pressure, grief, loss, and they begin to question God. Why God? Why this? Why now? Why me? And the answer is really simple. Why not you? Why not you? This is part of life in this world. This is the experience of all humankind in a sinful fallen world order. Why should you escape what everybody else has to go through? 
Did you think that being a Christian somehow made you exempt or immune from the hardships and struggles of life? Why not you? In this world, you will have tribulation. This is the suffering that is ours because of our humanity. But there's another kind of suffering as well. There is a suffering that is ours because of our Christianity. In a world sick with sin, in a world order dominated by hatred, lust, greed, selfishness, and lies, those who take a stand for love, holiness, righteousness, selflessness, and truth will suffer at the hands of others. Christians especially will bear the brunt of the world's hatred and animosity. Much of our tribulation is meant for our sanctification. We are promised in the scripture, promised, that we will suffer for righteousness' sake. Our scripture is 1 Peter 3, 13 to 17. If you're not there, please find it fairly quickly. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're picking up right where we left off last week at verse 13. Peter is writing to Christians in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, various congregations. These folks are not experiencing uh, persecution by the government yet, but a lot of persecution in their local area due to the fact that they have become Christians. Persecution from their families, persecution from their employers. Those who had been Jewish have been kicked out of their synagogues. Nobody will sell to them. Nobody will buy from them. There's a lot of economic, and some of them are experiencing some physical persecution. And so Peter writes to them, and he says, Let, oh, let's stand for the reading of God's word. I'm at 1 Peter 3.13. Now, who is there to harm you if you become zealous for what is right? But even if you do suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your heart reverence Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. And keep your conscience clear, so that when you are abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it is better to suffer for doing right, if that should be God's will, than for doing wrong. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the uh, witness and the life of the apostle who wrote it. But God, just knowing the historical context, just knowing what Peter meant when he wrote it, is not as important as your Holy Spirit applying this word to our hearts in our context so that we can live it out today in obedience. And so we pray, God, that you will make this word come alive in our understanding, plant it deep in our hearts, and then provide the grace for us to obey. Do whatever it takes in us to make this part of our life. That we might be pleasing to you, walk in obedience to you, and be a witness to those around us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Here in this passage that we just read together, 
Peter speaks of suffering for righteousness' sake, being abused, being reviled for our good behavior in Christ, and suffering for doing right. And elsewhere, in this letter, he has already mentioned suffering for doing right in chapter 2, verse 20. And then in chapter 4, sharing in Christ's sufferings, verse 13, being reproached for the name of Christ, verse 14, suffering as a Christian, verse 16, and suffering according to God's will, verse 19. Twice in his letter, he mentioned suffering according to the will of God. Wrap your head around that one. It is quite clear that if one chooses to follow Jesus Christ, they are choosing to go against the flow. And they will experience the current of the world rushing against them. We can expect some tribulation because of our faith. Now, around the world, there are still literally thousands of Christians dying every year due to persecution. About five to six thousand Christians die every year because of their faith in Jesus Christ. We're not much in touch with that in this country because we don't see it. We don't experience it like they do in other parts of the world. But our missionaries tell us stories of torture and death in primarily communist and Muslim countries. The top 10 countries in the world where Christians are killed, imprisoned, or abducted are North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Yemen, Iran, Nigeria, and India. Every day, 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Every day, 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked and ransacked and destroyed. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted. Did you know that? In our culture, persecution takes a different form. In our country, we are much more likely to face ridicule, loss of opportunity, perhaps insults. In our country, the press vilifies born-again Christians as narrow-minded bigots or devious charlatans. On a more personal level, there is often a high price to pay just for being faithful. Here are a few examples that I know of personally from my years in ministry. In the pastorates where I have served, primarily my church in New York, where I served for 15 years, often our young people were ostracized by their peers when they chose not to drink or take drugs or be promiscuous. Some of our youth were ridiculed by their teachers in school because of their Christian ideals. I knew of many Christian women who were constantly ridiculed by their unsaved husbands. And even their grown children because of their faith in Christ. Several people told me how their parents criticized them, almost disowned them because they left the religion of their youth to embrace a born-again Christian faith. One parent told a 
a man in my church that she would rather he not go to church at all than to go to the Baptist church. Some of our families chose to endure financial hardship because they wanted to have a stay-at-home mom. It was a decision they made because they wanted that for their family. They deliberately chose a harder way because they believed that the sacrifice was worth it. But then they were chastised by their parents and by their friends for being foolish and depriving their children by not making more money. Some of our couples were ridiculed for putting their kids in Christian schools. Your taxes pay for free education. Why are you paying to put your kids in a Christian school? And one man in my congregation was passed up for promotion at work and reprimanded by his boss because he refused to pad his billing in order to build clients out of money on behalf of his co company. All of us know full well that there is tribulation in life that is ours because of our humanity, but there is also tribulation that is due to our Christianity. Many Christians suffer for righteousness sake. And still, our suffering here in America is nothing compared to what other Christians around the world face on a regular basis. And I don't think we talk about that much in the church. I mean, not that we're complaining. But you're not supposed to talk about how tough it is to be a Christian. I mean, how are you going to get people to embrace Christ if you tell them how hard it is? But we forget that Jesus never watered down the demands of the gospel. He was a straight shooter. He never pulled his punches. He told people to count the cost before joining in. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He told them that they would experience betrayal by their own families and that old friends would become new enemies. And he said that if you would come after him, that you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and then follow his example. And to take up your cross means to endure the ridicule and the persecution of those who hate you because of your faith. And prepare to die every day to your sin, to this world, and for your faith. That's what it means to take up your cross daily. It means prepare to die. If the world hates you, Jesus said, know that they hated me before they hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world. But I chose you out of the world. Therefore the world hates you. The Apostle Peter knew all about tribulation on behalf of Christ. About suffering for righteousness sake. In Acts 4 we read of how Peter and John were arrested and jailed overnight. How they were dragged before the same high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, who had condemned Jesus and ordered by them to speak no more in the name of Jesus. We know how Peter died that he had to watch his wife crucified before him and then he followed her 
pleading that he might be crucified upside down so that he didn't die in the same manner as his Lord. Listen again to his counsel. But even if you do suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. He then quotes Isaiah 8:12, "Have no fear of them nor be troubled." And then he gives these instructions. But in your heart, reverence Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. And keep your conscience clear. So that when you are abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing right, if that should be God's will, than for doing wrong. And Peter here gives us three commands to follow when we must endure suffering for righteousness sake. Number one is reverence Christ as Lord. First and foremost, we are to reverence Christ as Lord in our hearts. This is a decision that we make. It is a commitment that has life-changing effects. Now, the RSV, which was my favorite Bible growing up, the RSV says reverence Christ as Lord. The NIV, your uh, pew Bible, has it set apart Christ as Lord. The word is actually to sanctify. And sanctify means to regard as holy. But it also means to set apart for a godly purpose. And I think that's how Peter's using the word here. In your heart, in your inner being, the deepest part of who you are, where you make your decisions and determine your loyalties, make this profound and life-changing decision. Jesus Christ is set apart as absolute Lord over my life. And Lord means ruler. Lord means master. Lord means sovereign. Lord means king. Lord means owner. Lord means authority. Jesus is Lord means that Jesus is offered absolute control over my life and everything in it. He has the right to determine my priorities by his word. He has the right to direct my actions by his Holy Spirit. He has the right to expect my faithfulness and obedience. Because I am no longer in charge of me. I've been purchased. I've been bought with a price. He is my owner. He is my master. He is my Lord and King. Jesus is Lord means that everything I am and everything I have belongs to him. I am at his disposal to be used to accomplish his work for his glory. My time, my energy, my possessions, my work, my home, my money, my education, my talents, none of those are mine anymore. Everything is his to do as he pleases. Jesus is not just my afterlife fire insurance policy, my ticket to heaven, and the one who answers my occasional prayers. In my heart, I must sanctify Christ Jesus as Lord. 
There is a big controversy right now in theological circles over the question of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And the controversy goes like this. Can you accept Jesus as your Savior, but not follow him as Lord? And you would be stunned, I think, how many people answer that question yes. Sure, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and now the cross and the blood applied to me. I'm forgiven, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. But following his lordship, that's works. That's for those who are more devoted, more mature, who want to become a disciple. I got from Jesus all I need. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Following him as Lord is optional for the more devout. Now, there's a Greek word for this kind of theology, and that word is hogwash. <laughs> more than that, it's heresy. The Bible says that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You don't have to make Jesus Lord. God already did that. God has made him Lord. What we need to do is surrender to his lordship. I want Jesus as my Savior, but I'm not sure I want him as my Lord. You know, I've actually had somebody say that to my face. Here's how it goes in the New Testament. Do you want Jesus as your Savior? Then surrender to his Lordship. If you surrender to his Lordship, what was the first statement of faith ever in the New Testament church? Jesus is Lord. Surrender to his lordship and he'll save you. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. Jesus is Lord. He's not satisfied just to be your savior. He earned his lordship on the cross. And you owe him lordship over your life. Number two. Number two is share your witness. Share your witness. Peter's talking about what to do when we suffer for doing right. And first, in our hearts, we establish Jesus as Lord. And second, we are to be prepared always to make a defense when we are called to account for the hope that is in us. This is our verbal witness to others. Establishing Christ as Lord is a decision we make. It's a commitment followed by steadfastness. Being prepared at all times to defend our faith involves a great deal of prayer and study and deliberation. Every Christian, if they are faithful, will be given opportunities to witness verbally. And we should be looking forward to those opportunities to share our faith. Some conversations will be quite friendly, and we should try to keep them that way. But at other times, they could become hostile. But we ought always to be prepared to tell others about the hope of Jesus in our hearts. Every Christian ought to be able to give a reasonable and intelligent statement of what they believe and why they believe it. We must know what the Bible says about the nature of God. 
what the Word of God says about itself. What do you believe about Scripture? Who Jesus is and how he accomplished our salvation. We ought to know about salvation by grace through faith and where in the Bible to find key verses. We ought to understand it well enough to lead another person to faith in Christ. And then we ought to go on to the deep things of the Spirit and maturity in the faith through the study of God's Word. And your faith has to be a first-hand experience and not a second-hand story. It is one of the tragedies of the modern church that we neglect serious study and reading of the Word of God. There are many church members who, if you ask them what they believe, they couldn't tell you, nor could they tell you why they believe what they believe. The Christian ought to be able to make a verbal witness, explaining according to Scripture to anyone who asks what they believe and why they believe it. But when called on to share our faith, even to defend it against vicious attack or ridicule, we are to do it with gentleness and in respectful reverence. Peter is quite clear about that. And Paul said the same thing to Timothy. A Christian must never come across as an angry, belligerent hater or as an arrogant know-it-all, we are to speak lovingly, with gentleness, reverence, humility. You will never argue someone into the kingdom of God. You may win the argument and lose a soul. You must share with the right attitude. But the one thing that no one can argue is your personal experience. This is what God has done for me. This is what happened in my life when I trusted Jesus. This is the impact that he has had on me. No one can tell you that you're wrong about your experience. They can argue theology. They can complain about the church. They can tell you their experience. But they can't say that your experience is wrong. This is what happened to you. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is just share our personal testimony. I came to God. I trusted in Christ. This is what he did for me then, and this is what he's been doing for me ever since. And nobody can, out, nobody can argue with that. And then I offered them the opportunity to have that same experience with Christ. Read the book of Acts. That's exactly what the apostles did. All right, number three. Number three is keep a clear conscience. This means to maintain our good behavior in Christ even in the midst of persecution as a living witness to others. Peter's argument is very simple and quite clear. People are going to hate you. They're going to accuse you of all manner of things falsely. Don't give them any ammunition. Don't give them any cause to accuse you of evil. Make sure that your behavior is so clean that they can't come up with anything of substance. Make sure that you are so obedient to Christ, that you're such a model citizen, that you're so well behaved, that their very accusations will be an embarrassment to them. Everyone will know by the integrity of your character that your accusers are lying. Can you do that? 
Can you walk with a clear conscience? The answer is yes, you can. But there's only one way. Notice the full phrase that Peter uses. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ. They must be put to shame. Your good behavior is in Christ. Your behavior has to be in Christ. It's actually his behavior working itself out through you. Only as we walk by faith, only as we are indwelt and, and, and empowered and, and led by the Holy Spirit can we manifest good behavior in Christ. It's only by walking in the Spirit that God produces spiritual fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That stuff only comes because you are walking in the Spirit on a daily basis. That's the way we walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And we can do that. But it takes dedication, it takes commitment, it takes consistency. But in the days ahead, as the world gets darker around us and more and more distant from God, and as the light persecution that we're experiencing only becomes harder and more severe, and as the practice of dragging Christians before councils and courts becomes more and more common, the need for our worthy walk and our good behavior in Christ will become greater than ever. The most compelling argument for the gospel is a changed life. Let a person so live that their conscience is clear. Let him encounter criticism, ridicule, even violent persecution, and meet those with gentleness, respect, a clear presentation of the gospel, and good behavior in Jesus Christ, and his attackers will be put to shame by their own evil designs. What do you do when you suffer for righteousness' sake? Establish Christ Jesus as Lord in your heart. Don't wait for suffering. Do that right now. Establish Jesus as Lord in your heart. Always be ready to give a defense of the hope that is in you and maintain a clear conscience through your good behavior in Christ, for it is better to suffer for doing right, if that be God's will, than for doing evil. Let's pray together. Lord, we know that when Peter wrote these words to his congregations in Asia Minor, that this was so relevant and so needed and spoke to their immediate need. And I believe that the Holy Spirit used it to comfort and encourage and strengthen them. And Christians around the world hang on these scriptures and, and, and clutch them close every day because persecution is their daily experience. And Lord, we're so far away from that in this culture that sometimes these passages don't even make sense to us, but one day we're going to need them. But the most important thing we can do daily for our Christian life is to walk under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Establish him as absolute owner, ruler, Lord and King. And I pray that that is the decision and the disposition of every heart here in this room today.
and that we'll surrender under that lordship if not. For we ask this and pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.